Hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the program on constitutional government, and we're um, operating today from snowy Cambridge, about four inches of snow out here, the first of the season. And we have as our guest today, Molly McGrath, who's an associate professor of philosophy at Assumption College. Let me say a word about Assumption College, a small college in Worcester, Mass, where I have many friends. It's a college that deserves to be better known, but might be ruined if it were. She's, um, as I said, in the philosophy department there. Uh, this means <laughs> we take it for granted that she's sharp and has a keen eye, penetrating, analytical, but not in the usual philosophy department sense of always making distinctions without a difference. But um, in other words, uh, smart, she can cut as well as sew, analytic as well as synthetic. She's uh, <clears throat> written for Quillette and other magazines, other journals, and especially, um, uh, I, I, I want to mention the articles that she's written on, on movies. <clears throat> and I, I especially like the ones on uh, the movies by the Cohen brothers which are always uh, somewhat shocking on the one hand, but uh, uh, rather thoughtful on the other, at least present challenges to the thinker. And um, Molly McGrath is a thinker. She's going to talk today on the authority of the sacred victim. So Molly. Thank you for that. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so um, what I'll do first is put in the chat just to, if, if it helps anybody, a kind of, um, you know, first that's a plan of the talk. I personally like having plans of when people start talking, know when they're ending, where they are more or less, and then some terminology just for you to look at um, when you feel like it. Um, so my basic hunch is that a sense of the sacred is the fundamental motivator behind what we are seeing today in what's called identity politics or cancel culture. I'll go through three main points here today. First, there's an a priori or conceptual part of the paper. Basically, I think there's a constellation of concepts centered around the sacred and we need to get those concepts clarified a bit before uh, moving on. Second, I'll apply those concepts to our current situation, arguing that the phenomenon of identity politics or cancel culture is illuminated by those concepts. Finally, I want to say something about the role of doctrine in the system and about the contrast between a prudential and properly political mode of thinking on the one hand and piety and a pious expressionism on the other. Uh, so first for the conceptual bit, <clears throat> I view piety and sacredness as correlates. So piety is something that we do. It is the subjective correlate of sacredness. Sacredness is the objective correlate of piety. In other words, we see sights, we feel feelings, we hear sounds, we taste tastes, and we are pious towards the sacred. Piety is the act of recognizing sacredness. And being sacred requires being set apart and set up, not being treated like a normal profane thing. That's because the sacred is ontologically elevated, incommensurably higher ontologically than normal things. That's what piety recognizes. It's being higher and untouchable means that it's not properly investigated or questioned and that the sacred thus has a sense of mystery. It's something above and beyond us. So piety and sacredness belong together and they immediately give rise to two other things, to sanctions and to sacrifices. Uh, the sacred is protected by sanctions because it isn't to be treated like another prof profane thing. It has special rules. It requires some kind of kid gloves. It can't be touched or spoken about in the normal profane way. Violations of these rules, violations of sacredness, often produce a pollution and the pollution needs cleansing or purging. And often pollution is contagious. It's not the same as a personal guilt. Piety and sacredness also give rise to sacrifices. It seems to me that you don't understand the sacred unless you see that it is worthy of sacrifice. Sacrifices are offerings to the sacred in pursuit of communion or harmony with the sacred. Piety has the dual impulses in it to kiss up and to clean up, to give gifts to the sacred and to get clean before approaching the sacred. Both kissing up and cleaning up are part of what sacrifices sometimes do. Also, sacrifices are status changers. Sacrifice changes the sacrificer's status along a vertical axis of the sacrificer's relationship to the sacred. It can also change his status along the horizontal axis 
of the sacrificer's position next to other people. Thus, once you have piety, you open up the possibility and incentives for pious show and status seeking. So that's the basic constellation of concepts surrendered, centered around uh, sacredness. Now the bridge between this and our current oppressive politics, um, that is to say the politics of oppression is the idea of suffering. Suffering is the middle term. It's the conceptual path linking sacredness and oppression. I think there is something uh, mysterious about suffering. It's purifying, it is transformative, it is a source of wisdom. So it makes some sense that suffering can be both an input and an output in sacred systems. Suffering has a sacred making power, but more than that, the sacred demands suffering. It's worth suffering for, and to suffer for the sacred is to prove that you know it's sacred. It purifies you to suffer for something higher. And of course, oppression involves lots of serious suffering. Oppression is a thing that happens, and it usually happens to people as members of a particular demographic group that's targeted. So we can distinguish between the demographic group that is oppressed and the demographic group of people involved in the acts of oppressing. That's like the background condition for the system of sacrificial politics to even get going. We need that for it to get off the ground. The groups in the A-list of oppressed categories today are black, female, gay, trans, etc. The oppressed, the oppressor categories and are their opposites, white, male, straight, and cis. Now I think what happens is that at some point, some members of the oppressing group start to feel polluted by the actions of people in their own category. They recognize the suffering involved in oppression is somehow sacred making and feel piety toward the oppressed and want to distinguish themselves from the oppressing demographic category. Let's call this subgroup the pious. They're normally called allies. Once you have piety and an apperception of sacredness, naturally you're going to get sanctions and sacrifices and also pious shows. I call this system sacrificial politics or sacrificial activism because I think sacrifices are both the primary input and the primary output of the system. And by the way, by sacrifices, I do not mean just self-sacrifices. The way I see this working is that people get a certain socially constructed status for their membership in an oppressed or oppressor group, dividing the world between the sacred people and the polluted people. What is sacred primarily is not the people as individuals, but the demographic group itself. And its members are treated as sacred only as symbols, avatars or incarnations of that group and its oppression. Along the same lines, I am not a, I'm not polluted because of anything about me as an individual. What is polluted is primarily my category and I come in as a symbol of the group. And then the question is, how shall I act given that my actions are symbolic or might be taken as symbolic of my group? So we are cast as either sacred or polluted, but there are different ways of playing these roles. What starts the ball rolling in the first place is that some of the polluted people step out from their group and gaze with piety at members of the oppressed demographic. So you've heard of the male gaze and the white gaze. I'm gonna say it's the pious gaze that produces sacredness as a social status. And when given the status, sacred people are protected by sanctions, special rules for how they are to be treated. And violating those rules is a kind of outrage or blasphemy that produces a special pollution that, and that pollution requires purging and punishment. Because the pollution infects the community of the violator, the group needs to sacrifice by purging the violator and thus cleansing itself. And piety in the system comes along with a general sense of pollution. The pious feel polluted by their past, by the culture's past, by their, by their co-members in their demographic categories. But they also feel, a, I think at a deep personal level, a certain kind of personal innocence, or at least they want to regain a sense of their personal innocence or prove their per personal innocence. And sacrifice is a perfect vehicle for that purpose. Pollution needs purging. I think today talk about privilege is often really expressive of this polluted feeling. Traditional notions of pollution often involve contagion. Unlike personal responsibility or personal guilt, pollution is contagious. Our way of talking today maintains that privilege belongs to everyone in the oppressor demographic category. And we are supposed to confess it like a sin or examine it like a bad conscience. The upshot, the upshot of all this is the desire on the part of the pious people to clean up and to kiss up. 
pious people want to make sacrifices. And sometimes that's more piety. Sometimes it's more pious show. Remember that sacrifices can be used to make oneself feel good and to look good and to get power over others by elevating one's status. Here are two other ways to play the role of a polluted person, that is a member of the oppressing group. One is to lay low. I call people who do this the profane. They are outside the temple. That's just what profane means. So they're neither sacred nor pious, but they carry the mark, the stain of pollution, and they know other people look at them as carrying that stain. The other group is irreverent. Sometimes this is on purpose and sometimes it's unintentional. I call these people the blasphemers. By saying the wrong thing, they cause a bit of an outrage and then they and their special pollution need to be purged. Everyone distances themselves. The pious people pile on. The profane people paint the blood of the lamb on their door and hope cancel culture passes over their house. Those events are, I think, best understood along the lines of a humane version of what in other places and times would have been blood sacrifices. Here are some other examples that, are good, that get illuminated by this analysis in terms of the sacred. Cultural appropriation is a violation of the sacred. The rule is that people in the oppressor group cannot touch or talk about things belonging to the culture of an oppressed group. So putting on Halloween costumes, running taco stands, writing novels or acting in a movie, the polluted aren't allowed to touch or speak the sacred things, or at least they aren't allowed to do so without some special dispensation or ordination. Another example is the seeking of pious status we call virtue signaling. But more interesting and more telling than the seeking of pious status is the seeking of sacred status. Jesse Smollett, for example, wanted to be the victim of a hate crime. That is, he wanted to be honored as among the sacred of the sacred, whose personal suffering is the source of the sacredness of the group. Since the famous case of Rachel Dolezal, we have seen more recent cases of transracialism, white people claiming blackness. We also see people within groups or across sacred groups, sometimes oppression bragging or competing. I think this makes sense. It makes sense as a certain type of sacred status seeking. Once there's an honored status, and especially when some benefit can come with it, people will seek that status. Here's another example. We've seen a massive iconoclasm recently, a destruction of idols. And over the summer at protests, many white people felt the impulse to kneel to the black people they were protesting with and confess guilt. The destructiveness of the riots over the summer are also telling. There is the need to destroy, but it isn't just a destruction. It's not like pure death drive or something like that. It's a destruction of things that are tainted by pollution. The things are under some sort of ban. And so it's a destruction as symbolic offering or recompense to the violated. And most remarkably, many of the people involved in the outright destruction are the pious, not the sacred. And a good deal of the surrounding communities and cities largely seem to consent to it as somehow symbolically necessary. Finally, I think the accusations against and punishments of blasphemers seem way over the top when viewed from outside the system. But these are symbolic punishments for the entire history of oppression, and there is no way any punishment could recompense the sacred making suffering of the group. So once we see them in the context of blasphemy, pollution, and violations of sacredness, then the extreme punishments aren't extreme. They make sense. In fact, it seems impious to me for someone to think that any degree of profane punishment or reparation could make things right. One of the most interesting features of the system is the way it structures our conversations about sacred topics. I think that suffering is wisdom bestowing, or at least it can be. In sacrificial politics, the oppressed demographic group is sacralized and the suffering from oppression by some members is functionalized as bestowing authority on the group as a whole. This goes along with various privileged standpoint epistemologies. They're called like the feminist standpoint epistemology that was trendy in the 80s. Suffering and marginalization are recognized as a source of insight and knowledge. We thus see an elevation of the voices of sacred people. This is what I call the authority of the sacred victim. This goes along with how the sacred possess for the pious a kind of authoritative mystery. And this is expressed in the common phrase, you cannot understand what it is like to be a something, black person, woman, gay person, trans person. Now this is the opposite of what normally happens to oppressed groups. Sacrificial politics here flips the normal situation because oppression usually involves a form of epistemic discrimination. That is members of the targeted group often face assumptions of inferiority or untrustworthiness. They are, they are not seen as people who could discover, understand or speak the truth reliably. 
Miranda Fricker has a great book on this called Epistemic Injustice. What happens in sacrificial politics, I think, is that the pious gaze reverses this prejudice into a superiority. The most important point is that the authority is, again, bestowed by the pious gaze. There are different ways that sacred people play the part that's handed to them by the pious gaze. I distinguish between three ways of playing this part, the spokesman, the constituency, and the defectors. The sacred spokesmen pick up and use the authority granted by the pious gaze. They call out violations, they demand punishments and offerings, all oriented toward the pious audience. The constituency mostly stays silent, but they are the ones claimed to be represented by the sacred spokesmen and by the pious people too, who sometimes speak for the oppressed. And then most interestingly and most tellingly, there are uh, the defectors. The defectors are those sacred people those members of the oppressed group who don't follow the script and don't say what the pious people and the sacred spokesmen want them to say. So they don't maintain the pious gaze and they lose their sacred authority. So sometimes people will say that a gay or black conservative isn't representative, or perhaps it's implied that a conservative woman is inauthentic or she's unconscious or brainwashed or something like that. Defectors somehow don't really count as what they are. This morning's news included a story about the Girl Scouts apologizing for congratulating Amy Coney Barrett in a tweet and then celebrating all the women ever on the Supreme Court. They had to apologize for that. Somehow uh, ACB does not count as a woman to be celebrated uh, by the Girl Scouts. Defectors enter a kind of no man's land. They get something like piety only from blasphemers who often misuse the defectors as proof that they are right and the pious people, their enemies are wrong. The authority of the sacred victim is presented as a form of representation. The reason we can dismiss the defectors' views is that they are not representative. But this is an interesting form of representation. It's not a statistical representation, and it isn't democratic. It is based on the other group, the pious people, selecting which position, positions and which voices from within the sacred group are worthy of honor. The pious gaze is what makes people representative of their category or not. The representation involved is really a form of symbolism. The system is always using people as symbols or avatars of their demographic categories. Now people complain about this sometimes, this form of representation, namely the privilege should not act, ask the oppressed to explain oppression to them. And the privilege shouldn't, of course they often do, put people of the sacred demographic in that awkward position where they are made to feel like representatives of their entire category. But being made a symbol and a representative of one's demographic group is a feature of the system. It's not a bug. I don't think you can do sacrificial politics or activism without it. The upshot structuring our conversations is that there is something like a doctrine, however quickly changing. The polluted people are supposed to believe in this doctrine out of piety. Disagreement is irreverent, a sign of insufficient devotion. The sacred people are, are supposed to believe this doctrine out of authenticity and loyalty. And before concluding, there are just a few things I need to clarify. First, I am not saying that this is a religion, let alone a fake one. I don't like the concept of religion. Recognition of sacredness doesn't entail a religion, whatever that happens to be, and it doesn't require belief in the divine. Uh, second, I'm not mocking sufferers of oppression by calling them in this system sacred victims. Uh, the word victim starts as a term for an animal made sacred through sacrifice. What interests me here is how the pious people in the out group see members of the oppressed demographic as made sacred through victimhood. Sometimes people object to being called victims and I wholeheartedly agree with his impulse. But that is an objection against sacrificial politics or activism, not against my account of it. People being cast as sacred victims is not a bug, it is a feature of the system. I don't think people can engage in this type of activism without appealing to victimhood, even if they don't like the connotations. And we might remember here that, it is not, that not only is the word pity a derivative of the word piety, but that piety and pity are awfully close. The system is paternalistic and patronizing and causes people in oppressed demographics to cater to the pity and piety of others for status and for gifts. Finally, I want to point out one reason why so many people in the sacred constituency category are so often silent. I'm sure that I don't completely understand why, but I think it's partly sometimes this. They don't want to feed the haters. They may not like or trust the pious people, and they may not agree with much done or said in their name, but they don't want to give fuel to the blasphemers. 
I too worry about feeding the blasphemers. Victims are more often and more naturally denigrated and dismissed than lifted up and honored. There are very many people who are actually victims of very many things. And pointing out how I think this system works, I do not want to add to what I see sometimes, a disdainful dismissal of people who are actually sufferers from all manner of mistreatment. Uh, and here's my concluding thought. Piety and prudence seem to me fundamentally different ways of thinking. This system, animated by piety in a sense of the sacred, is symbolic and expressivist. It is symbolic and expressivist. It is not strategic or prudent or fact-facing. It isn't about improvements or problem solving. The system gives us an interpretive lens by which we are likely to read events and statistics symbolically as further instances of sacred, sacred making suffering. When that happens, Sacred spokesmen demand symbolic offerings, including symbolic punishments, and pious people join in to express themselves. And with that expression, they make themselves feel better and look better and get power over other people in their demographic category by making them feel bad and look bad. And it is beside the point of the symbols and of the expressivist displays, whether anyone's life is actually improved by this or not. So that's my story. All right, thank you very much, uh, Molly. Uh, let me start with a first question. Uh, it seems to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, uh, that what you're talking about is more usually known as the phenomenon of political correctness. And political correctness comes from uh, Marxism or communism and seems to rest on the authority of, of science. This, um, science is powerful enough or discerning enough to find uh, a, a particular uh, truth in every action so that the party, the Communist Party, can say with the, the authority of Marxism that uh, this is politically correct. And, then, and this was actually a term that communists use. Sometimes they use it uh, sarcastically. Um, uh, but uh, today it's, it's, uh, it's, it's used and, and taken, of course, only sarcastically. But if, if, you, uh, if you have the authority of science behind the party line, then you cannot disagree with it. And that, that seems to be uh, um, a, a characteristic of, of what you're describing as well. Now, now, yeah, you said that um, yours doesn't have its, um, your way of understanding doesn't have its uh, source in, in uh, religion or the divine. Uh, and yet the, the language you use is, uh, is religious and doesn't seem to come from science. You know, although uh, you cite uh, Durkheim, others, other sociologists who discuss the sociology of religion. So, so um, how would you say that your way of understanding is, uh, is better or how different anyway from uh, political correctness? Yeah, I don't, I just think that political correctness is a more limited phrase insofar as it has a certain kind of baggage from Marxism. I don't think that the system that I'm describing is free of a uh, an influence for Marxism. I'll say something about that in a second. But I don't think it's as thoroughly Marxist as people, I think, sometimes say it is. And I think that might be a result of the psychology by which we're always fighting the last battle we lost. Um, that is to say, like, if you're raised where the, the main battle was between Marxists uh, and, and capitalists, or um, there, there's a certain kind of geopolitical fight that, uh, you know, framed um, people's lives until uh, the 90s, I think that, that that captures certain people and they kind of tend to interpret too much through that. Um, I know I don't think that Marxism, Marxism is irrelevant. I think that specifically there's a lot of um, kind of Christian influence in this system in the certain way that, that victims are sacralized. But I also think there's a Marxist or at least a strong sociological element insofar as what's sacralized is not the person, the incarnate individual, which is you know, fleshly and in, in, in uh, particular, but the category, this kind of demographic category, I think that's much more of a Marxist move um, 
than a, a Christian move. So that's where I see the influence there. Um, I don't know if, if political correctness otherwise helps much. I mean, it's, it's a phrase that captures the kind of intolerance, but where's the justification for the intolerance? Um, I don't think it's science. I mean, partly you can be very impious with science. Like, so for example, if you wanna do certain kind of you know, chemical experiments on a sacred object, the people who hold that object sacred will get very upset, right? Because there's a, a, an impiety there. And I think that all also happens with people who approach sacred issues in terms of scientific evidence. So if you say, well, hold on, let's really look at the evidence at what happened in this case, mm -hmm. you know, um, or let's really figure out, you know, controlling for all these variables, what these statistics say, right? And so you're just going to approach in a kind of scientific mode. I think that's impious. And it display it, I think it's, it puts on display that the system's authority is not really based on something like science. Okay, good. Um, let's another another question. Um, yes, uh, Jim, you may unmute yourself and ask your question. Jim Hankins, please. Uh, first of all, thank you for that very very interesting and I think um, uh, very helpful explanation for the current phenomenon that we're observing around us, uh, which seem to have been around for some time but to become ex extremely uh, virulent in the last few months. And that's sort of my question. Actually, I have two questions. The first question is, um, you've described uh, 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 this phenomenon in kind of sociological, anthropological terms. It's somewhat static, perhaps a closed system. Uh, but uh, I'm, and that's absolutely legitimate. And it's probably the first step, obviously, to describing this, this phenomenon. Um, but I think many of us are worried about where it came from, how it came upon us so quickly and how to get rid of it. Uh, that would be my, and there's been a lot of talk, I think started in the UK about um, purity spirals. And uh, many people have compared this particular uh, phenomenon to uh, the reign of terror in France, which had a sudden end I believe in uh, 1794 with Thermidor, suddenly the, the mental weather changed and it was a matter of months. So suddenly people began to uh, find all the premises and the whole sort of um, kind of moral structure of the reign of terror to be false and to be unconvincing and to be destructive. That it was suddenly changed. Uh, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about uh, this uh, phenomenon you've been describing uh, as a dynamic uh, phenomenon, where it comes from and how it might end. Uh, uh, that maybe is the work of an historian, but I, I wonder if you have uh, thought, about, thought about that at all. So that's one question. And just to pile on a bit, the second question is, where does the authority of the system come from? Which is, it's very mysterious uh, to many of us where these doctrines come from. For example, you mentioned the Girl Scouts uh, this morning, and someone decided that they should uh, they should uh, retract their compliments for Amy Coney Bryant, and she was not to be considered a model. Uh, who who where do these where do these eucuses come from? Uh, where do these and then everyone who is within that system that quasi system of the sacred and the polluted, everyone agrees that this is the correct response, that, uh, that any praise of Amy Conan Bryant can't possibly be, be valid. So I'm just wondering where, where the locus of authority is and how that, how that happens. I'm sorry to ask you so many, so much at once, but I, well, I, I found this talk very, very interesting. Well, thank you very much. Um, I have to say that I don't know, I, I can't say a whole, a whole lot about the whence or the whither, um, uh, of this movement, um, I, I but I think the two questions you asked are related. You know, you see people engaged in a certain kind of um, piety competition sometimes about the extremism of the the views that they take. So if you're among a bunch a bunch of pious people, and I mean pious in any kind of system you want, you know, not just this particular system I'm talking about. You're dealing you're you're in a room with five other pious people, and someone says something, and you're like, wow, that sounded hardcore, that sounded biased. 
And then like, you kind of can outdo it. And then like, if you're the one in the room that says, uh, I don't really know, I'll give you an example, a personal example, because it's just what's on my mind. I have a family member who last time I was uh, home visiting my family of origin was reading a book and the book uh, had a picture of the Capitol uh, of the United States on it, um, the Capitol building. And on top of the Capitol building was a statue of Mary. And the book was about how America had to become um, explicitly a, a confessional Catholic state in order to become legitimate. So you see this picture of Mary, the statue of Mary on top of the Capitol. Like, um, and uh, I think that kind of thought mostly comes from piety competitions, because if you're in the one in the room that says, I think that might not be wise, or I think that's not smart, or, you know, I think we will lose some kinds of important goods if we do that, then you immediately flag yourself as not being pious enough, right? And so that produces a kind of social dynamic in which people always have to push themselves to a more extreme position. And that's about purity and that's, that's about your level of devotion. And so I think that there's a very easy way in which these things can build on each other. Um, but having said that, sometimes like, as you said, with the, the French Revolution, sometimes that just kind of snaps and people are no longer under the spell. And I, and I don't think that it has to go all the way to the reign of terror in order for that to happen. Sometimes it just, you know, this is the famous story of the emperor not having clothes and a child having to, to say what everybody says. And then it becomes all right for other people to say it in the room. And then once it's all right to say it, then you can reason together again and you can think prudentially. But as long as the piety competition is happening, th there's just a really bad social dynamic that makes things more extreme. Yeah, I'm wondering if, at what point that snaps and why, because over the summer, for example, there was the, the Princeton open letter which responded to the George Floyd thing by making various demands, um, you know, how bad it was that George Floyd was killed and therefore we need higher salaries and more appointments and more time off, and, which didn't strike a lot of people as particularly pious demands. And then Stanford came out with its list of demands which was even longer and even more. And so at, what, at a certain uh, point, uh, the, the bidding war is gonna have to stop. And so I, I wonder if that's a possible exit from the, uh, from the, the sacred present. Well, I, I, my hope is, is that the, a certain stands are made by people in regular institutional positions of power who otherwise have to kind of kiss up and clean up um, in front of the sacred powers and in order to not get screamed at by pious people that if there's a certain kind of stand made in which said, hold on, this is not the only, you know, as Aristotle says in the ethics, you should not sacrifice everything to the same God, you know? In, in other words, that there, there are many things in the world to worry about. And when you're dealing with someone who really believes in a, a kind of sacredness, then those many things become as nothing, right? In, in dealing with that oneness. But um, when, when people actually have to worry about like an institution and have therefore many different prudential things in front of them that are just facing them and they have to deal with, um, then they will sometimes say, no, we're not going to give in to this demand. And I think, you know, uh, at a certain point, those things w don't work when they're just one-offs here and there. But then when enough people kind of do it together, more or less at the same time, it creates a, a, sense, that, a sense that you can get away with it, that you could get away with doing something other than what you're being told to do. So you're saying it needn't be a child that comes up and tells the truth, but it would have to be people in power this time, basically? Well, I don't know, but I, hopefully it's my provost, <laughs> I have to say. Hmm. Um, Tom Palmer, please, um, you can unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Professor McGrath, for your talk. Um, my question is, it seems to me that victims groups are looking for equality or superiority. And um, it seems to me that if, if I, my reading of history is right, that is not, they are not going to achieve that through asking other people who they think have mistreated them or, and who may have mistreated them or just ignore them by asking other people to do it. Um, that it's not a successful thing, whatever lip service they may be paid when they complain. Um, it's, it, it, it's not achievable that, and, and that through that means. And I wondered if you'd comment on that, if that makes sense. 
it does make sense. And I guess that's my deepest concern about the system is that it's incapable of properly strategic thinking. And so um, I've been thinking lately about the concept of institutional racism. I think it's an in interesting comment. Um, sorry, it's an interesting uh, concept, um, but I'm not qu quite sure what it means. And there are different ways that you could spell it out, which would make it either kind of a valid concept or an invalid concept, um, depending on how you answer certain questions about like intentionality. And I have an argument with a friend of mine that's kind of ongoing about whether or not maybe the minimum wage is institutionally racist. And depending on how you define the term, the answer I think becomes yes or no. So does, does institutional racism perhaps def need some kind of intentionality involved, racist intentionality? The, the phrase institutional kind of wants to back away from that. Um, does it have to be causally bad, right? Um, so, so does the history of, of of the minimum wage in the progressive era, which included a good deal of racism, does that matter? And second of all, do the actual economic effects of uh, the minimum wage on, for example, um, you know, uh, African American kids uh, in cities working, you know, when they're 18, you know, or something like that, do the effects of it, the economic effects of it, matter um, in order to make it institutionally racist or not? Now, th those questions are fascinating to me, but I guess my point here is, or, and you could say the same thing about like uh, the great society, you know, like and, and starting, you know, big housing projects, w knocking down neighborhoods and putting up housing projects. The pr intentionality probably wasn't there, but then you can talk about the effects. My point here is, I don't think in this system, you can really talk about the effects. You can't say, actually, will this program work? Will it make a difference? What effect will it have? Can we actually look at the data? I don't think you can collect the data um, because all of that implies a certain kind of impiety because there's a kind of untouchableness to it. And to even ask the question implies that you're not on board, that you, ha you have insufficient devotion. Um, and so one of my concerns is that the system won't allow you to do the type of uh, prudential or strategic thinking that would actually be necessary to uh, improve social conditions um, in the United States for these uh, several groups of people that have been selected as sacred, um, that instead it all becomes symbolic and expressivist. And, uh, and, then, and then it's like, likely to, to make problems in the long run worse, make people feel better in the short term, and then in the long run make things worse. No, I think that's right. People like the Thernstroms uh, automatically get rejected. And, um, and, you know, I keep asking my friends, what is just define systemic racism when they bring the term up? And as you know, Harvey wrote a whole piece on that for the Wall Street Journal recently. So thank you. Um, Avi Nelson, you may unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> A number of things have come up. You mentioned about the Girl Scouts. I'm curious, you know, what would happen if the Girl Scouts just said no? I don't know who compelled the Girl Scouts to reject a, an, an accolade for a woman who was clearly qualified by intellectual standards and had already been elevated to the court. In the broader sense, I see this period, I compare it less to the French Revolution or the Reign of Terror, where, where there was actually a wholesale slaughter going on. It reminds me more of the, the decade of the 60s. Now, the one, one German word I know is zeitgeist. There, there's, a, there's something in the air. There seems to be an, an intellectual ambience of the time, which plays for a while. And I don't know why the turbulence of the 60s eventually subsided. It just did, it, it just sort of played itself out. And I don't know who's setting the rules here. You talk about the pious and the sacred. Uh, it's curious to me as to how these things get, get assigned as it were. And, and the last aspect that I'd want to introduce is what I call the elitist racism. And that is people who will pontificate frequently the heads of organizations. You're getting all these, these uh, outputs from the heads of cultural organizations, museums and orchestras and the like, all very repetitive, saying the same thing, using jargon, getting back to what Harvey has talked about. And 
it strikes me that there really is not much there there, but rather uh, almost a looking down. Uh, oh, you poor black folk or all oh, you poor homosexual folk, you've had it so rough and, and I'm here to help you. I really sympathize with you and I, I would like to, to be your friend and to help you out. A lot of lip service and a lot of, of superficial action but none, nothing in terms of real sacrifice. You don't find any of these people who are in sophisticated categories, both in terms of their, their status and in terms of their wealth. You don't see them giving anything up. And that leads to the last point, which is that frequently the people who cloak themselves in being the sacred victims are looking for something. It doesn't take long in the conversation before the word reparations gets into it. And more often than not, it strikes me that, that people are interested in getting access to money they didn't earn from people who really should not be uh, feeling bad about having earned it. So we have this, this sort of this confluence, this swirl of stuff going on. And the real question for me is, how do we end it? How do we bring back some balance and some sanity in terms of perspective? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I, I will say that I, I try not to play uh, the parts of, I mean, I guess in some sense I've played all these parts in my, in my life at various points, um, uh, some more than others, but I, I especially try not to play the parts of the, of the spokesman or of the pious or of the blasphemer, right? Um, and that I think there's something that feels gross about taking on those roles. And let, I mean, there might be a kind of bizarre strategic situation in which is the right thing to do in order to protect a friend or something like that, right? I can, I can dream up a situation, but there's something gross about taking on the roles for me. And so I, I, I kind of hope that people just get kind of sick of the of the postures by which we're really um, manipulating other people more than we are expressing uh, piety towards something that's actually important. Like I, this, this account was, thinking this through was kind of weird for me because it actually made me much more sim sympathetic with identity politics than I had been before I had thought I had this kind of hunch and then I kind of played it out and I was kind of surprised about how far I could play it out. Um, I have convinced myself that there really is something that's sacred involved here in, um, in the way that people think about oppression and the way that we think about human suffering. And I think that there's something transformative about suffering and wisdom bestowing about suffering. Like, I think that's all true um, to a certain extent. I don't think that should lead to a sacralization of a group. And I don't think that means that every member of the group carries a special mysterious authority. You know, there are places in which I'd say that, that the system isn't um, responding well to this sense of sacredness, but I do, th I think there is some kind of piety that's, that's um, appropriate, for example, um, toward uh, the black experience in the United States, especially the slave experience. And um, I wonder if, one of the ways that we could move out of this is by making people understand how gross it is to misuse those kinds of experiences, which really do deserve a kind of piety, to, to misuse them as a source of feeling better and looking better and getting power over others by making them feel bad and look bad. Um, Diana Schaub, please. Hi, Molly. That was great. Uh, yeah, I, I got, a, got a question along these lines, I guess. Uh, I mean, the, the Black struggle has been around for two centuries. Uh, why has Blackness as sacred emerged in the last few decades? So I am interested in the question of origins, which is both, it seems to me, a historical question and, and to some extent a theoretical question. I guess my thought would tie it back to the Black power movement. Uh, the Black Power Movement was materialist, Marxist, separatist, sort of to the core. It had no sacred dimension, 
but it seems to me that in the mainstreaming of the black power movement that gets filtered through the traditional language of the black struggle, which often was religious. So what you just said uh, about the redemptive quality of suffering, I mean, that was present in all the great black thinkers, uh, Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, very present uh, in Martin Luther King. Uh, but all of those thinkers were pointing towards the transcendence of race. So that redemptive character, uh, yeah, it somehow belonged to the racial struggle, but whites could join fully in that, you know, be part of King's biracial army. Uh, it, it seems to me that now with the, with the mainstreaming of the, of the Black Power Movement, we've got a really perverse dynamic. Uh, so that the quest for black power is now interacting with the with the quest for white innocence. Uh, and it does seem to me that everything that you said relates in a really interesting way to a thinker like Shelby Steele, who's also very interested in the psychological dimensions of of what's been, you know, of what of what is uh, what has happened with white guilt. Uh, so Steele seems to fall sort of both sides. Uh, and to think that whites have become really complicit in this uh, through their attempts to, you know, um, get shut of, of white guilt without doing the actual work that needs to be done uh, in the way of uh, black uplift. Uh, so I, I, I just wondered, do you think that's, that's plausible? Um, and maybe just a question about Shelby Steele and how you think you're reflections relate to his? Um, he is so awesome. Uh, I have to say, I didn't, I always kind of intentionally stayed away from, I, I know that this is weird. I've always intentionally stayed away from any controversial topics. You know, like I'm a phenom I'm a Husserlian phenomenologist, okay? Um, I like talking about the origin of logic. Uh, and, and so like, I, I've always intentionally stayed away from those topics. I didn't discover Steele until I, I, you know, I was basically asked to give a talk on identity politics and I kind of had this hunch and I started playing the hunch out and then I started reading very seriously um, in the tradition and um, and so uh, I'm, I would defer to anything that he says ever. I don't think that there's, I, 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 I don't think I'm contradicting him in any way. I think I'm adding something. I think he puts a whole lot of pressure on white guilt and therefore displays of innocence. And I think that's absolutely correct. But I, I, I would add that there's also a kind of, what he doesn't have is the sense of piety. That is to say like, I think human motivations are really complicated. And in these people's heads, what is conscious is not, I'm trying to prove my innocence. Like there's just a lot of motivations going on. And one of them is an absolute awe and um, humbleness in the face of other people's difficult experiences. And I'm not saying that, I think that this system interprets that feeling badly. And I think it plays out badly, but I think that that experience is real. And I, I, I don't think it's just an obsession with proving one's own innocence. I think there's also a legitimate sense of piety, which is in, in there and also acting as a screen psychologically for the more self-serving motivations for the pious people. Um, about the first question of why now? Um, again, I don't know. I'm not, not a historian. Uh, you, you, I should ask you that. You know much more about this. But I guess my hunch is, is that heresies have a kind of interesting way of working. Once you take, so a heresy is to pluck out one something from the, the faith, right? So you pluck something out. And so if you have basically what is kind of a Christian idea, but it's playing out outside of the context of other Christian ideas. For example, you said transcendence or you know, like the kind of universality of suffering and the universality of human guilt, the, the, oneness, of the, the, the oneness of the sacrifice of the crucifixion, um, things like that. Like there are things in the Christian system which can, if understood properly, control these kinds of impulses, right? And then when you, when you get a, a, an idea and you take it out of its habitat and, and which would otherwise control its growth, it will, it'll grow in weird ways. And I kind of think that this idea of the sacredness of the victim is growing in weird ways now, partly because our culture is simply less Christian than it was uh, during Dr. King's time. So that this sense of the redemptiveness of suffering is playing out differently because people don't have 
their their feet tied to the ground in the same ways uh, theologically. That's my that's my hunch. Um, I have a quick follow up uh, question on Diana's. Um, I'm not so sure whether it's really true that awe and humbleness, you know, in the face of people's experience are that much of a factor, but you've studied this so much more. Um, I, I never have done that, but it seems there's so much very concrete suffering going on right now, right? In the US, you can have very, whatever, inner cities, or you have the opioid crisis, or, and those are things people actually ignore um, to look at other things like slavery, which is non-existent anymore. Um, so I'm not sure I would like you to ask, uh, to say a few more things about why you think that really is such a crucial factor rather than it's really something um, that is very symbolic and it makes it easier to to not have to deal with anything really because um, you're not addressing something very concrete at all. Yeah, I don't disagree with that, uh, but I would say that there's a kind of randomness involved in any selection of sacredness. And so it's like on you're on the outside and you're like, well, hold on, <laughs> why is that thing sacred and that thing isn't? Why are you let it touch that and not that? And so if you're on the outside of the system, there's always this kind of randomness that occurs. And why in the world are you killing a lamb and not say, you know, like a bird, you know, like why does the system do one thing rather than another? I think there's an intense randomness, especially from the outside for these systems. But the other thing I'll say about why the system is largely about um, slavery and not just slavery, but Jim Crow and then uh, continued statistical disparities um, and then other forms of oppression too. Like, I think it's important that this is not just a white black thing about oppression, but that the other groups are, are read in the same way um, I think that talking about the other types of very real suffering that you mention either seems not sacred, like the opioid crisis, right, or or um, or seems to be to be con too concerned about those things seems to be impious. And so, like Shelby Steele uh, will emphasize uh, the number of young black men killed in the South Side of Chicago, um, where their deaths are just completely ignored, right, versus the the, the deaths um, which take on a certain kind of enormous cultural symbolism uh, of, of victimhood. And, um, and I think sacredness is the right word for the status uh, taken on by those deaths that are focused on. Um, so I think that to talk about the, the first seems impious because, because it's not done by white people. It's not done by the oppressor group. And, um, and so it, it kind of escapes the system and it implies instead that, they're, that the system is wrong. And so they, they don't wanna think about those because it implies that the system is, is uh, ignoring things that are important. So I think that kind of embarrasses them. Um, I had another thought, uh, which is now gone entirely, I'm sorry. That's okay, Molly. We have a lot of questions, actually. <laughs> um, so, uh, Lior Saber is up next, please. All right, can you see me? Okay, hi, Molly. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, I've been waiting a long time to read uh, an article like yours. I thought it was just, it was, it was great. Um, I, I mean, it seems like, um, what seems right to me just intuitively is that you put the focus on the pious. <clears throat> um, and I found that in my own teaching that it, that's just a very good pedagogical tool to disarm students from kind of getting too absorbed in the pieties and getting them to think about, you know, their fixation on power a little bit more clearly. Um, I think you come close to depriving victims of agency in this system in your account, but I don't think that that's a, a critique of the account. I think that's a critique of the system. Um, so that's kind of what, what I find to be very, very helpful and, and, and illuminating about your account. My question though is about the deeper grounds of sacrificial politics. And specifically here I have in mind, you, you mentioned this in passing, um, uh, but you know, alternative accounts, let's say Hegelian accounts, um, you know, uh, uh, one thing that comes to mind is maybe Fukuyama's recent book, uh, Identity. And then maybe a, a couple decades before that, Charles Taylor's um, um, uh, writings on, on the politics of recognition. Uh, 
And it seems to me that um, these accounts are useful because they, they identify something that's missing in modern politics, um, which is, you know, as Fukuyama says, you know, it's forgetting of the, this third part of the soul that the, that the, that the Greeks recognized, the, the honor-seeking thumos. Um, and then for Taylor, of course, the need for authenticity is a need to live in accord with the moral voice within, where after Rousseau, the moral voice comes to be equated with just subjective feeling. And that's kind of how we get a lot of this kind of lived experience types identity politics today. But what I, my question to you is what's driving this on the side of the pious in your kind of um, account of, of sacrificial politics? I mean, you seem to rule out crass incentives like material resources, you know, more diversity trainers, more tenure track positions for black women. Um, I mean, that's obviously part of it, but you seem to suggest that it's not the most important part of it. And especially because it's not the, uh, the, the victims who are driving the system, but the pious. Is it some kind of psychological need? Um, if so, is that need, as you suggest at one point, a residue of a particular culture? I mean, you, you say that we're downstream of Christian culture. Or, um, or is it somehow embedded in human nature? Um, and then here, maybe you can go into kind of a more Nietzschean uh, direction. And then finally, as a consequence of that, um, what would follow from the answer to that question in terms of um, kind of thinking ahead? If it is, let's say, embedded in human nature, this need to, to have victims confer upon them the sacred, the, the sacred status. Uh, and the reason I ask that is how should people like us who are averse to sacrificial politics respond to it? Because it seems to me that if it's embedded within human nature, if there's a need for this stuff that's embedded in human nature, it seems that people like us should respond to it by trying to divert it in, in more healthy directions rather than try to fight against it, which may, which may, may prove um, useless. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very uh, complicated. I guess I, I love Charles Taylor. I kind of agree with that account in general, except that um, I think that the recognition that's required is at a higher level. It's not just that you want to be recognized, say, as a gay person, um, as opposed to liberalism just that just wants to recognize you as a person, you know, um, that it, it's that you want to be recognized as a as a person who's a member of a group that's special because it's been oppressed. And I think, in other words, I think the, the basic account in which this is about the need for recognition isn't wrong. I think it's right. But what kind of recognition, as what will you be recognized? Um, and I don't think it's just as a demographic category. You know, It's as a demographic category that has been um, through certain experiences and therefore needs to be treated differently as a result. Um, where in the soul this comes from, I, you know, I don't know. I think that's, that's above my pay grade. When I thought about the motivations for the two primary groups, the, the sacred spokesmen and um, the pious, I thought, I, I always kind of start with Aristotle, and I, and I thought that, um, you know, the sacred are largely motivated, I think, by uh, the desire to not feel like they can be hurt without uh, hurting back anymore. You know, so one of the things Aristotle says, it's book five, chapter five of the ethics, he says, um, you know, when when someone can hurt you and you can't hurt back, if you can't give bad back for bad, then that seems to be slavery, he says. And so I think that that I think the revenge there isn't just a, like a normal revenge or, you know, I think it's I think it's a sense of honor. Um, and then about the pious my best hunch was that, you know, what Aristotle says in book one about why it is that people pursue honor, it's to convince themselves that they're good. Um, and I think that's, I don't, I don't know if I can say anything more deep about the soul. Um, you know, there's a long tradition of this from, obviously, uh, talk about Thumos, you can talk about Nietzsche here, you can talk about Rousseau, there are lots of people you talk about in addition to um, Hegel. Um, I don't know if I can say anything much deeper than that. About the, the next question, what should we do in response? If this is a permanent thing, which I think it is, the need for um, honor, what's the, what's the proper response from us? I think it is to not be blasphemers. Um, the, uh, you know, we should, we should not intentionally offend the people with whom we have to live. That's one of the 
in, in Thomas's uh, in Thomas Aquinas's treatise on law, he gives it like only three examples of, of real rules in natural law. And that's one of them. You should not intentionally offend those people with whom you have to live. I think that the blasphemers in general are really counterproductive and, um, and they just are feeding the system. Um, but I don't know what to do other than that, uh, other than, you know, I want to abstain from the system in this, in this sense. I don't want to use these categories, uh, these sacred categories. I don't want to use them to make myself feel better or look better or to get power over others by making them feel better, look bad. And I just kind of want to stay out of that as much as I possibly can. And other than that, I don't have any other upshot or marching orders. Question. No, you can ask. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, th uh, th people like you, uh, Molly, are fated throughout your life to think above your pay grade. So, so get used to it. <laughs> um, uh, here, uh, here's a question uh, that uh, has occurred to me. Uh, I'm about, sure that wasn't an insult, Molly. Ab about piety. <laughs> uh, <laughs> about, uh, yeah, it seems to me that um, uh, there's a... Um, a responsible and an impressive and an attractive um, uh, piety, a piety of gratitude that that you 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 give thanks, you count your blessings, and and, um, and 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 try to keep your temper. But then there's also a piety. Perhaps this is the one you're referring to, of of punishment, because it seems to me that. The whole the system that you describe is as a whole directed at punishing and, and the punishment is somehow the center and the aim of everything I'm, i don't even believe so much in liberal guilt because uh, th those people don't really feel guilty they're, they're but rather they're seeking to uh, to punish to find revenge what do you say? Um, I do think that this is one of the ways in which, I mean, there are plenty of examples in which Christianity is not terribly Christian in the last 2000 years, but I think this is one of the examples in which the system is not Christian. That is to say that the, the types of sacrifices and the ty types of punishments they seek, um, uh, you know, it is very unforgiving. It's, there's a certain kind of need for blood or something like that. Um, what was the second bit, Harvey? I got distracted. No, that, no, that, that was it. Uh, the piety of gratitude versus the piety of, of punishment and liberal guilt. Oh, liberal guilt. I, I am kind of confused by this. I'm, I, I suspect that there's a kind of um, cognitive dissonance, some kind of mixture of emotions that don't quite get along here. In, in in so far as how you can make consistent a real strong personal sense of, of superiority um, and innocence and also the intense feeling of pollution. Um, I think my, sus my suspicion about liberal guilt is that it's a mixture of those things, that it's, it's a feeling one's the guilt of one's category, but not really feeling it usually as a form of, of personal guilt. Um, and I, I think that's what all the privilege talk is largely about. And that's why it's important that the privilege doesn't actually involve being privileged in any objective way or having any uh, you know, actual benefits necessarily that, you've, that you can count. And it doesn't actually involve necessarily ever doing anything wrong. Not that there's any of us who have never done anything wrong, but I think that it's, they feel the, the pollution, but I don't think that they, generally think it's a personal thing. And so then they become obsessed with proving to themselves that they are superior to other people in their category, that they're not actually guilty of the sins of their category. So I, I, don't, I don't really think it's guilt, but I think it's interesting. I think it's an interesting psychological mixture of things. That's my hunch. Okay, thank you. Um, the blasphemers are, are detractors and unhelpful, but when you have a situation like in France, right, with Charlie Hebdo, for instance, it becomes very hard not to want to support the blasphemers even more, because otherwise you're getting into an even dicier situation. 
I don't know whether you want to comment on that. Maybe I just wanted to say that we have uh, at least three more questions. Well, I'll, I also say about the blasphemers that sometimes you just can't help it. You know, if if you're in uh, a situation in which you're required to speak in a certain way and you don't want to speak falsely, or then sometimes you you know, and sometimes it's important someone speak the truth, and and then you might just be forced to say something that people find offensive, and that's sometimes unavoidable. So I don't want to make it seem as though blaspheming in this system is always bad. Okay, we have uh, three questions as of now. Sarah Gustafsson is first, and then Jerry Zurif, and then Susan Hamilton. Okay, great. Um, thank you for this paper. It was really fun to read. And I know that um, you know Professor Hankins wrote, wrote a piece recently for First Things on, on recovering pietas. I know that in the somewhat niche circles of Twitter that I'm on, there are a lot of young people talking about how we need a new Aeneas and a recovery of, of pietas. So this is a uh, something that's on a lot of people's minds. Um, my comment sort of picks up on, uh, is a question that I had before, before Professor Mansfield asked, asked his question, and you sort of began to respond a little bit, but um, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about mercy and forgiveness. So just to make sure I wasn't missing anything in your paper, I did do a, you know, a, a, a search of the words in your paper, and it is notable that mercy and forgiveness is, is not there, right? And I, I'm, I'm, that, that says a lot. Right, not necessarily about your paper specifically, but about the subject matter that you're unpacking, and um, and to the degree that we are, um, you know, it's uh, I really like the title of your paper, the authority of the sacred victim, and you know, um, in Christianity, right, the authority of the sacred victim involves the authority to forgive sins, right, and to extend that mercy, um, and so that seems to be quite. Um, quite different and quite important. And it's a, it's a power that he extends to his, his priests here on earth, right? Um, to bind and loose. Um, and so I, I was wondering if you could comment on that a little bit more um, and also sort of flowing from a little, a little bit separate but connected, um, the degree to which, um, you know, maybe as Lior said, some of this is based in, in human nature as opposed to Christianity or, something more like Gnosticism, Manichaeism, as opposed to, well, which, which you know, has its Christian variant as a Christian heresy. Um, but the degree to which these modes of thinking, particularly, I mean, I, I really love the way you use the word pollution, and that made me think immediately of, of Gnosticism, right? Um, so the way in which that might be, um, we might be downstream of that as well. Well, we're downstream from a lot of things, I guess, many, many things. Um, yeah, I think that that this system just lacks some kind of emphasis uh, on mercy and forgiveness. There was a, a rather nice, I guess, movie, and it was based on a book um, that came out uh, recently called Just Mercy, which is about um, a civil rights activist, uh, specifically having to do with um, uh, incarceration reform. And I actually, I, 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 it was not, it was a, it was a recent um, work movie book in, in the genre of identity politics, which was not sacrificial politics, which was not about this, this way of thinking. So there, there are still places that, that shows up. I just don't think it's part of this system. And um, I think that's one of the ways that it makes the system just not healthy. That is to say, like, you can, you can have a sense of the sacred, right? You recognize something as sacred and then you respond to it. And when you have many people together by a sense of the sacred, they're pious in a certain way and they respond to it together that they develop habits and practices as ways to express their belief in this, the sacredness of whatever the sacred thing is. And I, I think my problem mostly, mostly here is with the practices and the habits of the way of responding here, and they do lack a sense of mercy. I think that all, many of the pious are after forgiveness, um, a sense of, of something like that, but I don't think it can possibly accomplish it. That there's some kind of um, there's some, there's some kind of incommensurability between the things that that the oppressed group, the oppressor group, the polluted people can actually do. And then there's an incommensurability between that and what could actually, you know, make up for, you know, so that there's no way in which forget forgiveness is ever forthcoming. 
And the things that are demanded as offerings are all not going to help, it seems to me. Most of them won't really help uh, the situation. And so I just don't see that, that, that the system is geared towards mercy and forgiveness. But that isn't to say that, that isn't to say that there aren't people out there who are quite forgiving and merciful and, and just don't play politics this way. Jerry Zurif, please. Uh, thank you, Molly. Um, John McWhorter, who is, as you know, is a major defector, um, uses many of the same terms and concepts that you do in your system, but he does call uh, what we see today religion. Uh, you declined to call what your system is as a religion because um, I'm not sure why, because the major explanatory power of what you're saying is the analogy with Christianity. And so it seems that we, you could call your system religion without the divine. I'm not sure why you don't do that. And the other thing I want to ask is, um, are you not a blessed seamer? Uh, don't you think people uh, in the system are going to find your talk today offensive? Well, about the last point, I guess I'm not trying to be offensive. You know, what I'm what I'm trying to do is analyze something and describe as best I can what I see. And if, if someone finds it offensive, you know, yeah, obviously I'm, I wouldn't be surprised, right? On the other hand, I would like them to try to give me words that they would like me to use whereby I could describe the same reality in, in a non-offensive way. And then I will use those words, you know? In other words, I'm I'm simply trying to articulate the thing in front of me, and and I'm not I'm neither trying to be offensive, but nor do I see a way to avoid that accusation entirely, um, and still describe what's going on. Um, about the concept, of, I just don't like the concept of religion. I think it's a kind of modern, vagueish thing. This concept of religion. I think that the real human experience, the primary human experience, is of sacredness, and that if anything, religion is a is a human communal response to some, some apperception of sacredness. Um, but when you say, well, what are the essential parts of religion? Does a religion need a God, for example, like that? Or um, it, it, it seems to me like, or, or sometimes when, when people argue that a certain types of politics is religious, what they really mean is that it's intolerantly doctrinal, that it's just overwhelmingly dogmatic. And, and one of the objections I have against the count is that, that that makes it seem like religion is defined by being a bunch of intolerant dogmatists. Like that's not what defines the experience of human beings. What defines their experience is that they think something's sacred and they're responding to it, right? So I'm trying to put at the center what I think is at the center of experience for people and to analyze that and to see what leads, you know, what comes from it. Um, but when we start with a concept of religion, which I think is one vague, and it's kind of a, a kind of a modern concept about trying to make something private, which otherwise was public. Um, and then on top of that, the connotations are more insult than revealing, you know, by thinking that some kind of dogmatism is the, the essence of religion, which I don't think it is. Um, so that's, I, that's why I don't want to use the concept of religion as central. Um, Susan Hamilton, please. Hi, yes, thank you very much for this. It's been very helpful, um, as I've also been trying to think about the difference between this new successor ideology and religion. Um, a couple questions. You've talked more about blasphemer. I think you've somewhat answered it, but so how would you describe people who are not in this system? Are they non-believers? I mean, you have your three, the, the categories of the pious, the sacred spokesman, and the blasphemers. How do you, who are you, who am I, who are, are we non-believers and should we look to historical categories of people of different faiths living together um, harmoniously to, to see how we should act? I mean, I'm, I'm just very curious about how one goes about not being a blasphemer if you're, if you're attempting to not blaspheme, but, and yet still live with integrity. How do you see that going forward? And then, sorry, one more question. As you were thinking through this system, which I just find fascinating and the, and the correlation and similarities between sacredness and our political situation at the moment, did you find any categories that didn't fit? I mean, it lines up so beautifully. Um, but as you were thinking through these religious practices and our attitude towards the sacred, were there things that just didn't quite fit? And I'd be curious about that. 
Um, I guess I can't remember. The answer to the last one is I can't, I'd have to think about that harder, about what was, you know, one of the things that was really difficult for me was thinking through the way in which this, the suffering was sacred making without being an intentional sacrifice, at, you know, in the beginning of the system. But I think that's how it works in, in the same way martyrdom works. That took me a long time to figure that out. Um, and, uh, but I, I can't remember any other particular pieces that were really like, you know, boulders in the road that took me a long time to work through. Um, about how not to blaspheme uh, or where we are in the system, where I am in the system or where you are in the system. So I think that it's almost impossible sometimes not to blaspheme. And part of the reason is that this is a system of social constructions. That is to say, that's the trendy way of talking now about what philosophy has always called custom or nomos. Um, th these are categories that are put on us by other people. And so that we are cast, you know, if, if that you're recognizable in, 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 as a member of a certain demographic category, you're cast in a role. And so you're just kind of out of luck. You're in that role. And then you've got to play it. Sometimes you're in a situation which you've got to play it in one way or another. And you can play possum, right? Which is what the sacred constituency often tries to do or what the pious try to do is they can play possum, but then sometimes you can't play possum. And then do you play pious or do you, do you kind of spit something out which is seen as blasphemy or then all of a sudden people see you as a defector or something. So I think that happens to people. I don't think that in our culture that you can I don't think there are many places where you can avoid playing this entirely. Like, have you ever been on a faculty committee? Um, in, in which case you're kind of put in a situation in which people are going to recognize you as a certain way and cast you as a certain way. And therefore you're, you'll be playing that role whether you want to or not. Um, and then the question is how, how do you play it? Um, in other words, there's a deeply involuntary um, aspect to this. Um, I, I personally think of myself more as a defector, but I, I think that defectors um, are, it's also a very dangerous position to be in and to be a defector against in one category is also to be a blasphemer in another category likely. And so um, uh, I, I'd like to stay out of it as much as possible, but I don't think that's, I just don't think that's feasible. Um, and so other than not intentionally blaspheming, there's not much to do as far as interfaith ideas go, I think that, you know, it's kind of miraculous, or choice maybe, it's kind of miraculous that um, religions in the West have grown so tolerant of each other, right? Um, and that they almost view it as part of their religion, that they're supposed to tolerate other religions. There is something really profoundly amazing about that. And one of the things we're seeing, for example, in sacrificial politics and its uh, confrontation, sometimes it's actually a direct confrontation with um, a religious institution. For example, I teach at a Catholic school or there have been um, various religious institutions around the country that have, have statues desecrated and stuff like that. Um, is it, it really is a kind of uh, uh, um, a headbutting of two visions of the sacred. And then the question is whether or not you can get the people who are kind of into sacrificial politics to recognize that the individual, um, th that there's a sacredness to all human individuality such that we should respect each other's uh, liberty. Like that's kind of the move that made, you know, like the traditional Western religions more tolerant was that, that move down to say like, okay, error has no rights, but human beings do have rights and those rights include to be in error, right? That's kind of the move that, that happens. Um, and can this system make that move? I'm not sure. Um, I have another question and I think it's, it's just to, to try to get you to maybe just sum up again or um, rephrase um, how exactly the sacred differs from other moral terms is them. Um, because you distinguish religion from a more basic fundamental concept or human need for something sacred or something elevated for something that has, I think you said, an elevated ontological value or meaning or something like that. Um, what exactly is the difference between, you know, what we call a moral experience or experience of something sacred? Are you saying that the sacred experience as that, that you want to define today 
um, requires a Christian history, which in turn is um, based on an elevation of suffering. And you don't find, find these things in other uh, cultures or religious histories in the same way. Or I'll just let you explain. But what's the, are they coextensive, the sacred and the moral as something fundamental? Or are they, uh, is there something very precise to the sacred as you want to uh, describe it for us? Yeah, I wouldn't want to make the claim that you'd need a Christian backdrop or history in order to think this way. I, but I just would, my hunch is, is that the way it developed here was with that backdrop. And, um, and then it could always be transplanted. I don't know. Uh, about the relationship between the sacred and the moral, I guess what actually I'd pick on there is what you mean by moral. I don't know what you mean by moral. Um, you know, I'm an Aristotelian when it comes to that kind of thing. And I think everything is moral. Like how witty are you at a dinner party? That's a moral question. <laughs> that's, a matter of, that's a matter of character and virtue. Um, and so I don't view the moral as a different part of life that's set apart where you have like this big part of life that where moral questions don't matter. And then all of a sudden there's this moral domain. And I think that's, um, I think, I think that if you thought if you thought of the moral like that, then it would the moral would really have a certain kind of sacredness to it. That the two concepts would become really close together. But for me, um, I think moral just applies to all action in life, um, and you know, trying to act well. And there are certain things that are, I think, always wrong, um, but many things that aren't always wrong, but can be done wrongly or badly in a situation. And so I don't feel the same. Uh, I don't feel the same closeness of those two concepts of sacred and moral for that reason, but maybe I'm missing your, your question. Do you want to try, try again? I feel like I'm cheating. Is moral profane? Well, um, that's, that's, I, I think that moral insofar as it involves prudence and prudence often involves balancing all kinds of weird things in human life, then yeah, the moral involves a lot of profane things. And then the question is, if there is this kind of something that challenges um, the importance of profane things, not just because they're more important profane things, but categorically and uh, incommensurably, then you're really in trouble regarding what sense you can make of the importance of the moral life in the sense of and this is the problem that Aristotle has in book 10 of the ethics when he argues against the inclusive end, you know, the, the, the inclusive end or the dominant end view of human life. Like if, if there are a whole bunch of different goods in life and, and they're all about getting the basket right, you know, then he can say both that contemplation is the highest good and that political life is good. But if he really wants to say that contemplation, which is this activity we do in which we, we commune with the divine and, you know, reflect on the divine ideas with the divine mind, um, if that's really the good, and he says that's the same thing as living a good human life, then all of a sudden that moral life would just kind of like be in real trouble. And so I don't think that this is, I'm not ready to answer that problem, right? But I think it's a problem that appears in a lot of different philosophers, how it is that you might deal with the manyness of the goods and the competing of the goods in the profane sphere and whether or not this sacred thing, which you might recognize, will somehow respect the profane sphere as what it is and therefore let it preserve itself or whether it will challenge and destroy it because it's just too freaking good. It can't let the profane have any goodness or something. So I think that's a kind of, I think that's a kind of tension that appears, uh, I used Aristotle here, but I think it appears in, in different thinkers in different ways, that kind of tension. Okay, we have time for one more question. It just showed up. Jeff Paulet, Paulet, mm -hmm. please. Let me mute here. Hi, Molly. Um, I wanted to ask you, it seems like a, a large part of your argument is just dealing with the ubiquity of violence um, and the ways in which we try to maybe tame violence or make sense of violence or maybe even domesticate violence somehow, and that this kind of system um, is a way of accomplishing all those things. So I'm kind of curious, without a system like this, what, how would we uh, contain violence or, or make sense of violence without some maybe state monopoly of it um, as an alternative? Well, you know, I, I think, I, I, you know, for the first time I, I taught, um, Freud, uh, Civilization is Discontents, uh, last semester in an ethics class. And the students were all like, I don't know about this death drive thing. 
it doesn't seem to exist to me. People don't go just around destroying things. And I was just like, seriously, white suburban girl just set fire to a Wendy's. Okay, like what's going on? Like, do you not know what's going on in your country? Death drive. Um, I think there are, and I'm not a Freudian, you know, but there, there is something to this idea that there's violence erupts and it's a permanent part of the human being and it is a threat to civilization and civilization needs ways to try to channel it and control it. I think, I think that's all correct and that there are various systems by which we do that in various ways that we do that. I mean, trying to teach your children to be kind is one way. Um, it may be engaging in uh, ritual religion is another way. Like, I think, I think this is a kind of problem we've got to throw the kitchen sink at. Um, I, I don't think that, I think that this system is partly dealing with that question, trying to interpret past acts of violence symbolically so that we can make sense of them. And then um, certain other acts of violence would be appropriate as responses to um, uh, continued violations of the sacred. I think the system is involved in that. Uh, I, I don't, it, it worries me that it is just justifying of um, a lot of extrajudicial violence like that's what Antifa is up to, uh, is that justification. Um, I don't think that we should look for a permanent solution to that. I just think this is a permanent human problem. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, you say without a system like this, you mean like some other um, sense of the sacred that channels and interprets the violence. Maybe we do need something like that. I'm not sure. Do you, uh, uh, would you like to answer that question? Do you have an answer? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I, I sort of think about Rene Girard or something like that, that you know, Christianity does kind of provide an answer to this cycle of violence um, that you need um, some kind of um, final sacrifice uh, that, that brings the cycle to an end. It doesn't make violence itself actually end, but it makes a, a kind of um, it, it breaks the, the cycle of desire um, that leads to the kind of violence. So, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I just think outside of some kind of religious or quasi-religious um, system, which helps us make sense of and domesticate violence, um, then it gets really untamed and out of control, unless you have the state then come in and just monopolize violence and impose order that way. Well, um, Molly, we're, we have to stop, but we want to thank you very much. It's been a pleasure getting to know you. And I think we all know that we've been listening to a mind. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was lots of fun. And thank you for taking my idea, idea seriously and asking me such good questions. <laughs>